You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Hey there, welcome back to the Barbell Logic Podcast, brought to you from Graysteel Strength and Conditioning in Farmington Hills, Michigan. I'm Jonathan Sullivan, your guest co-host. I'm the co-author of The Barbell Prescription with Andy Baker, and I'm joined once again by my co-co-host and producer, Noah Hayden, my associate coach here at Graysteel Strength and Conditioning. He's also a Barbell Logic online coach. Hey, Noah. Howdy. And our guest once again for the second time is Nurse Ann Bizard. Hey, Ann. Thanks Hi. for coming back in. And um, so we've covered a lot of ground already in this series on the barbell prescription. We talked about the sick aging phenotype and the barbell prescription, talked about exercise selection and modification for masters. We talked with Ann's daughter, Laura Welcher, about programming considerations for masters. We just in a previous episode, finished a discussion with my client, Debbie Rotslavsky, about the barbell prescription for female masters. And today, we're going to talk about the often neglected but critical central issue of recovery in training. The most important aspect of training, do you think? Uh, you know, in many ways it is. I, I view... Maybe behind consistency. Yeah, but consistent recovery. I mean, oh, you know, yeah, it's... You it's, it's I view it as the fulcrum of the training program. You know, it's, you know, the old saying, I think it's very wise. You don't get stronger from lifting weights. You get stronger from recovering right. uh, from lifting weights. So I really see it as sort of the linchpin of the entire thing. And even more to the point. So I've said this many times in the past, so I'm going to say it again. You know, if you exercise, like you go to, like I go to Pilates twice a week, or I do aerobics three times a week or whatever, Right. So you exercise, and that's good. That's all good. It's better to exercise than to not exercise. But when you train, training being the rational, systematic manipulation of training variables for progressive improvements in fitness attributes and physiology and body composition, when you train, recovery is central. You have to pay attention to your nutrition, your sleep, your active rest, and all of that. And so, you know, we say that exercise is part of a healthy lifestyle. But training, because of the central importance and the specific attention to recovery variables, training is a healthy lifestyle. Training exactly. is a way of life because it brings in everything, right? Not just what you're doing in the gym. It's like those old cereal commercials from the 80s. It's part of a healthy diet, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's part of a healthy lifestyle. It has right. to be an integral part. It is a healthy lifestyle. To be an athlete of aging is to follow a way of life. Yeah. Right? To be an athlete is to follow a way of life. And so, yeah, I, I see recovery as the linchpin and that expansive part of training that works its way into all the things that we do in life outside of the gym, right? Even in the way we work, right? So, we're going to we're going to manage our schedule better. We're not going to if we have that option, we're not going to overwork ourselves. We're going to sit up straighter at our desk. Maybe we'll get a standing desk. We're going to pay attention to what we eat at lunchtime. We're not mm -hmm. going to get overly stressed about what happens to us on our job. We're going to increasingly learn to put things into perspective because that stress is going to interfere with our ability to adapt to the stress that we have to absorb here in the gym. And so I see recovery as this pivot and also as the sort of all-encompassing training variable that makes training into a lifestyle and being an athlete and an athlete of aging as a way of life. Mm -hmm. So you can't overemphasize recovery. If someone is fully committed to training and fully committed to putting in all the effort that is needed, all the mental effort especially that's needed, to uh, succeed and progress with strength training. It's always surprising to me when you have lifters that show up every time, they don't miss sessions, they train hard, they put in all that effort and they skip meals and just can't figure out how to quite get more than six hours of sleep a night 
You know, they just can't find the time. And really shortchange themselves. So they're dedicated in the gym. Just won't eat the, pr- the protein. But you have to be dedicated outside the yeah, gym Yeah, all too. of that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But when it comes to masters, we face some unique challenges that are not confronted by our younger and less deserving counterparts, would you I think say? That, I think that recovery is more critical for older athletes. Yeah, but also more difficult. Yep, yep. Right? So we have greater emotional stressors in our lives than, you know, some kid who still lives with his parents and like doesn't have to worry about a mortgage and exactly, you know, and his, and his cholesterol or whatever. And sleep is tougher, getting the necessary, you know, protein and can be tougher for us. Active rest can be a little bit tougher. So that's why we've dedicated a whole issue to this, you know, often neglected issue of recovery. What are the components of recovery, Noah, for the, for the athlete in general and the athlete of aging in particular? Well, the biggest one is sleep. Interesting. I guess we could talk because about I think, that first. I think a lot of people would say the biggest one would be nutrition. So people tend to think about nutrition first. And if you look at the fitness culture out there, like on YouTube and Instagram and the blogs and all that kind of stuff, you see lots of attention devoted to nutrition. You should eat this. Pre-workout. No, you should eat that. Yeah. Pre-workouts. Multivitamins. And, you know, <laughs> keto all the way, fasting right. all the way. You got to eat paleo. No, you can still, you should eat vegan for a better world and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. So, but you don't see any blogs dedicated to sleep, right? Mm-hmm. You don't see the sleep channel on YouTube. Maybe there is such a thing, but I don't know. But it's not, it, it just doesn't have this big role in the fitness conversation. And why? Because, you know, it's hard to get real religious about it. And I, don't, I think it's beyond contention that you, you have to get your sleep, but we face challenges. And Anne, we were just talking about this before we, um, before we began recording. It's not always easy for our master. No, no. Some nights I'll wake up quite frequently and then you're exhausted the next day and that affects your nutrition and whether or not you want to get out and go for a walk. Or... Mm-hmm. And your performance under the bar. It can have, an, oh, correct. It, you know, it ha- you know if, you have a, if you have a great night's sleep, you get your eight hours or your seven and a half hours and you don't have to wake up six times to pee and, you know, and you just wake up and you feel completely restored and refreshed because you got a good night's sleep. You know, maybe you'll still hit your targets if you don't get a good night's sleep, but it's a lot more enjoyable when you're rested and, and recovered. You know, the best sleep that I've had in the last 10 years Hmm. when I got intubated, when I had my hernia (laughs) surgery, I know that's not really sleep and but, sort of sleep. oh my god was that so awesome i woke up and i it was the first time that i had no body pains so let so me long. ask let I was, me ask you i was a so question. comfortable what was the induction agent that I'm, they used i have no idea so i've got to ask but it you, was kind of nice it was how relaxing. long was your, how long you had a, her, a hernia surgery right? yeah a, i don't know if they use ketamine for something like that but an open an open double sitting on one side. It wasn't bilateral, Hard but to I think had that they two do hernias. Under ketamine, although ketamine is getting used, uh, not ketamine, uh, propofol. Uh, propofol, propofol is, what I was is wonderful for pre-op. Yeah. It, I've it, had it just for so a they like might, colonoscopy. They might have given you propofol it. because that's an almost universal report that we hear when people get inducted with propofol. They wake up and it's like, God, that's the best sleep I ever had. People, you, I felt like, so at rest. Yeah, you, you wake up after milk of amnesia. If you remember... Right, if they used propofol, you would have seen this big bag of milk hanging on an IV, and that's what they know. were. It's it's like that's what they call it, milk of amnesia, because it's white. <laughs> it's white, and so yeah, that was the whole Michael Jackson thing. He he wanted to sleep, and so this like yeah. crazy doctor would come around and give him propofol, which you'll sleep and you'll probably, sleep really well. Probably not a good idea to do all the time, but I definitely enjoyed it, and I yeah. look back on it fondly. Not the days that followed. So um, when I tried to get out of bed, but so that I was suppose nice. at this juncture, it's incumbent upon us to say no. We do not consider <laughs> propofol <laughs> to be a part of a rational program of training for masters. So not no, a, not a good sleep not, agent. Not recommended. And in fact, you know, we'll probably talk about sleep agents here pretty quick. So what kind of strategies do you use for sleep, if any, and to to try and optimize your your sleep? I try to keep a regular schedule. I'm usually critical in, in bed by 10. Mm-hmm. I usually wake up by 6 a.m., 6, usually 6 a.m. That's eight hours. That's my good time. And I might wake up once or twice. Sometimes I have a bad night where I'm awake more than I'm asleep. But I mean, 
That doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. I don't take any agents. I try to cut off my coffee by uh, five, six o'clock. Smart. Yeah. So you're hitting, you're hitting all the high points. So this is the area that we call like sleep hygiene, right? So, and consistency is, you know, that's the theme that runs through it. So you want a consistent bedtime. Ideally, you would sleep in the same bed every night and under the same conditions. You want a nice, dark, relatively cool environment, Mm -hmm. right? That's comfortable. And so consistency and timing and space and the conditions in which you sleep. For masters, I think cutting off the fluid intake and particularly the caffeinated fluid intake well before bedtime is critical because for me, the most common cause of not getting a good night's sleep is I keep drinking or I keep drinking coffee. When I fall down on the job and my sleep hygiene, that's what it is. I drink too much coffee or I drink too much fluid too soon before bedtime. And, you know, and if I have to get up like four or five, six times a night to pee, then, you know, I'm just, I'm screwed, yeah. you know, the next day. And that happens with enough frequency that I probably should be better about it. You probably also want to limit your intake of food well before bedtime especially if you're a master and you have the common problem of reflux, Mm -hmm. right? Or if you get a lot of bloating and stuff like that, because that can interfere with your sleep. Alcohol before bedtime is a big no-no. Yeah, it will help you fall asleep faster, but it will interfere with your ability to remain asleep. Those are the big ones is you you want to maintain consistency in your sleep schedule. And then the other thing for masters is because some middle of the night reawakening is inevitable. So what I have found has been helpful to me, and I've started doing this over the last year, is to have a return to sleep strategy. I have to get up, I have to go pee, and I have to come back to bed, and I get back in bed. And a lot of times what happens is, is you're not able to fall back to sleep, right? right? So Ann knows I do Tai Chi a lot. And we actually have a little Tai Chi program here at Grace Steel for Masters that is growing. What I'll do is I'll close my eyes and I'll start to do the yang form in my head, right? And my brain gets bored with that pretty quick. My brain is like, oh God, he's going to do that. You know, and like, I'll just switch off and I'm out, right? I almost never get through the whole form. I hardly ever even get halfway through the form. But if I just lay there and think, oh man, I had to get up and pee. I really should be better about my fluid. And tomorrow I got a coach and I'm going to be tired and like, right? So that's part one of a return to sleep strategy. Have something like that. It doesn't have to be obviously what I do, but some sort of like sort of sequence or set series of thoughts that you have to go through in your mind and that you do the same way every time and your brain just kind of gets bored and will switch you off. I think it's a mistake to go to bed and try to read. And part two of the strategy is, is if you're laying there and you can't fall asleep no matter what you're doing, and you're 25 minutes in, my rule is if it gets to be 25 minutes and I can't fall back to sleep, I get up. Hmm. I get up, and then I go to a book, like a chemistry book is ideal, right? <laughs> Just go. Do, I'm gonna go do a little chemistry review, or I have a book on emergency medicine that I keep close by. I just go down and like, you know, review cardiogenic shock or something like that. And I get sleepy. Sounds and then, engaging. Yeah. And then I'm usually able, that, that's usually able to put me back to sleep. But what you don't want to do is get into a situation where you're laying in bed and you can't fall asleep and you're tossing and turning. And, and you're suddenly, not changing the stimulus. You're not changing the stimulus. Yeah. And you're also programming yourself as like, well, this is fine. You know, I'm laying mm-hmm. in bed and I can't fall asleep. So... Um, that's my two-part strategy for going back to sleep. Have something in your mind that you will go through the same way every time. And that will, over time, that won't work at first, but it will eventually program your brain that it's time to go back to sleep. And then the second thing is, is if you can't fall back to sleep, and this has been looked at, right? The best thing to do is to get up and go do something not too engaging, right? Mm -hmm. Like reading a chemistry book until you're sleepy again and you know you can fall back to sleep. And then try that sequence again. I use numbers. I will start with 100 and pick a number. Yeah, maybe no sub- counting sheet subtract, thing. No, subtract sevens. Oh, and I've go done on that. Down. Yeah, yeah. Count back hmm. by sevens. Yeah. Right. I Apparently, find... 
that's an IQ test for prospective presidents now. <laughs> <laughs> I find that my mind tends to just race and race and race. And so the thing that's worked for me when I'm having trouble falling asleep is more like meditation. It's trying to actively clear your mind of any thoughts. And I always start that by trying to relax the muscles in my face and in my throat and my neck. And then I slowly go down my body. And with every exhale, I try to relax that focus area more and more. Mm -hmm. And you kind of get bored after you've gotten down to your stomach or something. You know, by the time you actually get through the head and neck and shoulders and arms, that seems to work fairly well for me, just trying to become more and more of a fossil, more and more of a low energy I state. It, I think that's not unlike like doing something like if you have like a Tai Chi sequence or a dance sequence or something like that, that you can go through in your mind where you're like physically, you know, feeling yourself doing it and you're breathing the way you would do if you were doing it, especially Tai Chi, which is something like supposedly a relaxed kind of thing. It's actually not as relaxed as people think it is. And just having something like that, that you program yourself to do. The important thing is to like, if counting by sevens works for you, that's what you should do every single time. Right. right. And then, you know, there's a whole bunch of ancillary issues like sleep posture, like what's the best sleep posture for you. Uh, as I've gotten older, I find that like the astronaut position is the one that works for me where I've got pillows under my knees and I've got like a nice neck pillow under my head and maybe a, like pillows under my arms. So I'm in that position, like when you see the astronauts and they're asleep on the space station and they're floating and all their joints are in the neutral position and you're just sort of like you're floating. And that's what works for me. I used to sleep in left lateral decubitus and uh, I've been able to do that for many years. Every now and then I'll like, I'll feel like oh, I have to roll on my left side and that lasts for about two minutes and, uh, and I'm back on my back. And then, you know, finally, I think for people who find that sleep is a challenge, it's a really challenging part of their recovery strategy, a sleep diary is really good. Trying to identify those factors in your diet and your stress and your pre-sleep stimuli and what's waking you up and what's keeping you awake. Trying to identify factors and patterns that you can potentially correct. Oh, and one more thing, you've got to turn off the tech, mm -hmm. right? You've got to turn off the tech like an hour or two before bedtime. That means that means no TV, no video games, no computers, no mm -hmm. Kindle. You know, people say, well, I've got the blue shade on my Kindle. It's like, I don't care, turn it off, right? Right. Sleep is a disengagement from that part of your life. So you've got to begin that disengagement. And I think it goes without saying that it's a capital error to take your work to bed, to take the computer to bed, to take, you know, even a book to bed, to take food to bed, oh my God, the horror, right? <laughs> they taking food to bed, you know, all that stuff. If you're doing that stuff, you're just not serious, right? So you're not serious about your sleep and sleep is huge. I have had restless leg syndrome most of my life and it's actually gotten worse as I've gotten older and now it's in all of my limbs mm. and that's a real struggle. So what I have found works best for that though is what you originally said, Anne, that you have to have a sleep schedule. So what was that? The stagecoach that turns back into a pumpkin mm -hmm. at, at midnight. If I push it and I get to bed an hour or so later than normal, that really starts to kick in around that time. And then it's almost impossible for me to have a good night's sleep. And I just have to be more vigilant right. about so my it's, scheduling. It's, it's kind of horrible for you, but also there's a silver lining, which is that it enforces really good sleep hygiene and consistency on yeah, your Yeah, you part. get punished if you don't do yeah. your job. <laughs> the other thing that um, I found is that I have to wear earplugs if I'm gonna get a good night's sleep. Interesting, and, and I, don't I have know, not had to go there. I don't know when that started, but I think it was in my late 20s or early 30s I can be in the deepest sleep and I hear a tiny little noise and I instantly wake up. I don't know if it's from having children. Anyway, I have to have earplugs in now or I can't sleep. So I think where all this points to is something that is actually useful in the larger context of living life. But for me, going to bed is kind of like a tea ceremony. You know, it's, it's like this, it's it like this be a ritual, it's a ritual. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a tea ceremony. So I try to do the same sequence of events in the same order every 
single time and to do them all well and to be like present in that moment of like, now I'm getting ready for bed, right? Now I'm brushing my teeth and now I'm putting on like the hand lotion because if I go to bed, my hands are dry and itchy. I can't sleep. And, you know, and, and just following that same sequence of events every time, a, like a chano you, like a tea ceremony of going to bed that just puts you there. Mm-hmm. And the flip side of that is, is that when I have to sleep under adverse circumstances, like I have to stay up late because I have a project that I'm trying to finish a, on a deadline or something is screwed up about my sleep ritual, it's very disruptive. So, you know, that's the flip side of that. But since most of the time I'm able to follow that sleep ritual at a particular time and do things in a particular way, you program your body to fall asleep quickly. And then if you combine that with a good falling back to sleep strategy as a master, because you're going to need it, right? You're going to usually be able to get the restorative sleep that you need, the most anabolic substance known to man right, is sleep. That's when the muscle grows. And so that's what we need. And that's also not just musculoskeletal health and metabolic health, it's synaptic health, right? We're increasingly aware that good sleep is important for good cognitive function into aging and good cognitive health and brain health as we get older. So, you know, if you're that guy like me and you're in your 40s and you're like getting five hours of sleep a night because you're oh so productive, you know, and you know, you're such a hard worker and all that. Well, you're really doing yourself and your family a disservice because there's emerging evidence. It's not strong, it's contentious, but it's out there. You know, this issue of, you know, you might be putting yourself at greater risk for cognitive decline in your later years. And, you know, that might turn out not to be as big a risk factor as some people are saying it is now, but since the alternative is to just get your good sleep, why wouldn't you just get your good sleep? Keep it simple. Yeah, keep it simple. So here's something I wanted to ask you, Sully. What about taking melatonin? So I take melatonin. How does that work for you? It, it seems to work pretty well. Is it a placebo effect? I don't know, but it's part of my Chano you now. It's part of my sleep ritual, right? So to take my melatonin and my other supplements as well before bedtime, I like to take my other supplements as well before bedtime with a little sip of water. I'm pretty good at taking that with a minimal amount of fluid. And that includes melatonin. Now, for a while, I was actually taking Benadryl as well to go to sleep. And I found that Benadryl and melatonin would put me to sleep and I would actually stay asleep better. I would get a more complete night's sleep. And the reason for that is, is that Benadryl, as you know, Anne, is, I mean, that was a standard, you know, patient needs a sleep, a sleep aid, and That's, the yeah. doctor would write for Benadryl, right? Correct. Yeah. So um, it is an anticholinergic, it has a soporific effect, um, but because it's an anticholinergic, it also has the effect of you don't have to pee as much, mm. right? So it tends to keep you from having to wake up to six times a night, and that's beneficial. Then I started to think, well, yeah, that's a drug, that's a sleep aid, and it's more of a, of a strong, really pharmacologic sleep aid than melatonin. And there is some indication, again, it's not strong, it's not a proven association, uh, it's just sort of out there, and people are looking at it. This idea that your total lifetime anticholinergic load might represent an independent might represent an independent risk factor for developing various forms of dementia and Mm. cognitive decline later on in life. Now, is there anything there? I don't know, but I find that I'm able to get pretty good sleep now without the benefit of Benadryl. Two or three times a year, I'll take it in sort of desperation if I'm having a particularly bad night. But in terms of sleep aids, the only one I use is melatonin. Some people use valerian root. I think that's been a little bit debunked though the effect of valerian root is not that great and in truth the evidence for melatonin is not that strong either Uh, i tried melatonin before it worked really well mm. the first night i took it and went out like a light it worked great and then about three days in it didn't do anything sounds like placebo sounds like placebo effect and a lot of people think the effect of melatonin is a little bit of a placebo for me it's just part of what i do and if you think about it, that whole 
bedtime tea ceremony that I'm doing, the whole thing's a placebo, right? right. The whole thing is a signal to it's your, the signal. whole thing, right. Yeah. So let it be. And, but that does bring us to the issue of sleep aids. Do you ever have to, I don't want to be too personal, but do you ever have to use sleep aids? <laughs> no, I have in the past tried Benadryl, but it has an opposite effect on me. Mm -hmm. makes me very jittery and keeps yeah, me that, awake. It, it, it's known to have a paradoxical effect like that in a certain proportion of the population. Sometimes, it sounds kind of silly, but I'll just have maybe four ounces of yogurt mm. and eat that, especially if I wake up in the night and I can't get back to sleep because mm. I don't have any it's other system I, I use. I don't but know I'll, that's all I'll try some yogurt. I don't know. Maybe I'm hungry because I do the intermittent fasting. Or maybe you're just giving yourself a little insulin boost, right? <laughs> so, because the yogurt usually has sugar in it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I use the plain non fat. Oh, well, and I don't know. Insulin is soporific, right? You, so when you eat a big dose of carbs and you get sleepy afterwards, that's why. Insulin is basically telling your body, okay, you're fed. Go sit under a tree right. and metabolize, right? Um, but um, Well, there would be some carbohydrate in it. Yeah, there would be. So, um, so maybe that's what's going on there. In terms of stronger sleep aids, things like Ambien and, I don't know, Lunesta. Is Lunesta? Please, please don't take Ambien. Please it don't. Wasn't even, it wasn't even developed as a sleep aid. That's right. However, I will say I have had Ambien. Like I was, I was hospitalized about four or five years ago. And for I an Ambien-related event? No, not for... <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know where this was going. <laughs> what was I hospitalized for? Uh, your disequilibrium? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was for the disequilibrium, and I was getting worked up for a cerebellar stroke, and I had to have an MRI the next day. But I couldn't sleep, and I was on the 3T unit, the observation unit, at receiving hospital, my old stomping grounds. And my, uh, my friend and colleague, Phil Lewoski, said, here, take this Ambien. You'll sleep. And boy... Did I ever like, and it took no time at all. And I, I slept, but that is not something that needs to be part of your lifestyle, right? Yeah. Please. If you have trouble sleeping, the answer is not to go straight to a sleeping, a pharmacological sleeping adjunct. The answer is to go to your doctor, get a sleep study, because if you can't sleep and you've done all of this other stuff, and you've maintained a sleep diary, and you've eliminated fluids before a bedtime, and you're following a ceremony, and you know, you're doing everything right, and you still can't sleep, and you find that you're tired the next day, there may be something else going on, right? Maybe you have sleep apnea, maybe you have obstructive sleep apnea, or maybe there's something else going on. And you'll never get good sleep if that's not addressed. And you'll never addressed. get good sleep, and your underlying issue will remain undiagnosed, right? right. If you just, put a Band-Aid on it and just like nuke yourself into oblivion instead of finding out what's actually going on. So that's when it's time to go see your doctor and get a sleep study. So I think that's pretty much what we have to say about sure. sleep. Do you have anything to add to that? Anne? Not that I can think of. Well, this does go into the next point very well, though, that I know that I always sleep a lot better if I'm pretty exhausted from a lot of activity that I've done that day. Either training or active rest. Right. So active rest. Active rest. Right. It's important that, you know, we talk about, well, you, ha you have training days and you have recovery days. So you train three times a week. That doesn't mean that you sort of devolve into a state of torpor, like on the other, you it's know. It's a rest day. So yeah, it's a rest day. So I'm going to No like, moving. So no, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I don't know how widespread that particular error is, but let's just correct it right now. That is not the answer. So you need to be engaged in some sort of physical activity every single day of your life, right? And that can mean going for a walk. It can mean doing yoga or Tai Chi, or maybe part of the reason that you're in strength training is that you have a sport or some other physical avocation that you enjoy. Maybe you're a martial artist. Maybe you like to play baseball or tennis or swim or something like that. Well, then you need to be doing that, right? But every day needs to have some sort of physical activity in it. That isn't training, that's it's an know, active lifestyle. It's exercise and an active lifestyle. That's the active rest component. So take your strength training on those days where like, for example, the day after a, a heavy, you know, a heavy day on heavy light medium and you go and you swim some laps mm -hmm. or you go and you, you go to martial arts class or something like that. You're still getting to recover because that's part of your baseline. Now that's part of your, 
baseline physical activity, you're not moving heavy sets of five, you know, you're not at the very end of the bioenergetic spectrum, the intensity isn't high. So you need to be doing that. That's your active rest. And Noah's absolutely right. That's going to help with your sleep. It's going to help burn off those extra calories. It's going to help you incorporate that protein into muscle. It's going to help keep those joints mobile and supple and alive and ready for action. So that is an absolutely critical component. And I know you do that, Anne. Mm, You're very active outside the gym. I am. I try to be. But when I get up in the morning, it doesn't matter what I've done the day before, if I have a workout day or it's just a routine day or like this week when we've not had training, I'm very stiff. I'm very, very stiff when I get up. Join the club. And Mm. I usually just... After a hot shower, we'll get up and just, you know, walk around the house, move, uh, maybe practice some Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. And then every evening, I try to do a two-mile walk that I have figured out a loop in the area. I adopted a dog recently, and it's the best thing that I ever did. I can imagine. For For active rest. Yeah. Because now I feel bad, and she's mad at me if we don't go for a walk twice a day, which turns out to be about four miles a day that we have to walk. And if I didn't have her, I would just keep working, working on my laptop or or reading a book or Mm -hmm. whatever. And she's a total pain in the ass sometimes, but (laughs) but it's great, right? It it gives some structure to your life. So that, you know, that has to be there. So, you know, it kind of goes back to that old aphorism, lift weights and play your sport. Well, maybe your sport is, you know, walking around the park or going for a walk with your dog or Tai Chi. You know, the Tai Chi thing keeps kind of keeps coming up. It sounds kind of like cute and floofy to people, I imagine. But for somebody like you or me, like yeah. I wake up stiff, right? And that early morning, just doing that quick 10 form that I'm teaching you guys, it's not even the short form. It's just a really, really short 10 form. It takes what? The whole form takes maybe two minutes to perform, and then Not you long. add that to a little bit of uh, a little bit of stretching, and you know maybe some squats and some ankle rolls and stretching your shoulders out. The whole thing takes five minutes, and all of a sudden, you know, it opens everything up. But you have to have something like that. You have to have the active rest. So there has to be something beyond training. You have to bring your strength to something. Mm -hmm. right? You have to use it. So find something like that. And as long as it doesn't interfere with your training, you're, you're good to go. And what's next, Noah? Well, the biggest thing besides sleep. The elephant in the room is nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nutrition. Some of you are probably what we call our pogs, the patrons of Graysteel, people who like, you know, send us, you know, as little as a dollar a month on Patreon. We have a private Facebook community called patrons of Graysteel. And we have a pog vlog where you know Noah and I, mostly Noah, make videos for our patrons. And you recently made an excellent, excellent sort of summation of nutrition. Maybe you'll go over that for our Barbell Logic listeners. You think so? Yeah, just like like quickly, like in you know. No, I mean you thought the video was good. <laughs> oh yeah, are you kidding? No. Was it was it outstanding? It was Am I right? Yeah, your videos are oh, well, thank videos you. are all good. Yeah, they're very good. Everyone's talked about nutrition so much. The biggest thing that I will say is your body's composition is the result of your lifestyle's composition. I think that's the main thing that people need to remember, and that can be a uncomfortable mirror to look in. Oh yeah, your lifestyle composition is what you do, obviously, and the materials you put in your mouth. And I know that's a weird name for food, but I've started referring to it this way because otherwise people fall back on it's food. Contextual, yeah. contextual, unhelpful terminology like health food and junk food, right. which all have negative connotations. Both of them are bad in their own ways, right? You're supposed to eat healthy food, but it tastes terrible. It sucks. Yeah, and junk food is Delicious. all the color in life. And you should feel guilty for but it. It's horrible. Eat it in a closet while you're yeah. crying, you know, a crying sort of tears of guilt. Puritanical nutritional outlook. Yeah. yeah. None of that is helpful. Right. So they're both negative terms. So I try to think of food in terms of the spectrum of quality, depending on the purpose for eating it. I think that's key because the same food could be a high quality source for one purpose and a low quality source for another. Exactly. Like, like beans, let's say not really a great source of protein when you're talking about high quality protein sources. It wouldn't be the first thing on my list, but not a bad source for 
carbohydrates. Yeah, not a right? bad, not a bad. Has fiber workout. in it, you know. It's yeah. it, it could work, especially for if some you're people. working out alone. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say that's why it might work for some people and not for others. Uh-huh. So if you think about your ideal body's composition, think about what materials that's made of. It's gonna be for everybody probably. Water. A lot of protein, a lot of meat right. makes up a body like that. A lot of water makes up a body like that. You're probably going to have a lot of fiber in your colon, mm-hmm. right? If you want to have a, a healthy intestinal tract, not a lot of fat, but enough to be healthy and to have normal hormone production, right? Right. Strong, dense bones. Minerals and vitamins. A whole lot Calcium. of uh, thick tendons and ligaments. Protein again. Right. What else? Well, that's about it. Carbohydrates. So, carbo- and, and enough carbohydrates and enough, fats to support that. Right, enough carbohydrates. And carbohydrates are actually structural material in one sense. So, your cell membranes incorporate carbohydrates. You know, carbohydrates are actually important structural molecules as well. But you have to have a pretty low carbohydrate diet, almost, you know, zero carbohydrate diet to have any problem getting enough carbohydrates for the structural components. The reason we eat carbohydrates is as fuel, which right. actually brings us to this issue of eating to fuel the workout. But before we get to that, you know, one of the things that you talked about in that Poglog video that I thought was really, really cool, you tied it into what to do when you're hungry. What I really liked was this sort of like hierarchy of eating yeah. That you propose, like, you know, when you're hungry, maybe you're not hungry, maybe you're thirsty. You right? could be. Right? So the first thing you do is you drink some water, right? And then if you're still hungry, the way you presented was like, your go-to is protein, right? right? Not carbs, not fat, right? But protein and a relatively pure protein, like, you know, chicken breast, yeah. you know, sliced turkey. As low fat as you can afford, essentially. Right. And then you're going to work your way down this. Right. The next thing that you should eat is fiber. Fibrous carbs, not starchy carbs. And I would say fiber should mean to you green leafy vegetables. Exactly. Right. Not an apple, not all the other options for vegetables, which are really starchy tubers like uh, potatoes and yams and everything else. Or green leafy vegetables. Or fiber in case sugar juice. Right. 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 Which is not bad, but it shouldn't be your next choice on that. On that hierarchy. And if you get through all of that, eat some carbs and some fats. Mm -hmm. And most likely by the time you get there, you will eat the correct amount of those foods and be satisfied instead of starting with potato chips or cookies or fast food or whatever else people eat. Which never ever fill the hole, right? Right. Until you actually get sick, right? Right. You can eat that stuff until- And you're still hungry. And you're still hungry. Yeah. Horrible. So, um, it's a dysfunctional list of priorities, you know, with food like that. So that brings us to the issue of fueling workouts and the pre-workout. And again, there's a lot of quasi religious positions on this, you know, a lot of fanaticism about it, but I really think it's very, very simple when we're under the bar, we're working primarily in an anaerobic energy system. We need high power outputs. And that means only one thing, as far as I'm concerned means carbohydrate, yep. right? The power signature for carbohydrate metabolism far outstrips the power signature for fat metabolism. Now, if you're, you know, if you're an aerobic athlete, you're a total expert at oxidizing triglyceride. But if you are training under the bar, you're training with the prowler, or even if you're doing something high power like judo, right? Or martial arts, and you try to do that without carbohydrates, you're simply not going to have the performance that you need. So for me, the pre-workout is carbohydrate and a little bit of high quality protein to provide, you know, alanine and those carbon skeletons that will help support the anaerobic training. Now, what do you do for pre-workout, Ann? Usually oatmeal and yogurt. Yeah, I'm totally behind that. Oatmeal is, oatmeal is my go-to. Steel cut oats because they tend to leak the glucose a little bit slower and a scoop away, and then a little bit of granola because crunch and yum, not because they're really <laughs> needed. And uh, Noah, what do you do? I eat two bagels and, uh, and a little bit of protein, but not much. Simple. And that's about 100 grams or more of carbs, but that's about all the carbs I eat for the whole day. And I do that on purpose. I cram it all in an hour, hour and a half before I work out, I guess about an hour, 
And then I don't eat it the rest of the day because I don't really need it the rest of the day. I'm fine. And that fine. brings us to this issue of bracketing. So you're going to have a certain, you know, unless you're one of these ultra low carb people, right? And if you are, you're probably not training here, mm -hmm. right? Um, but um, that brings us to this idea of bracketing. You have a certain carbohydrate budget in your macronutrient allocation and you're going to you're going to tend to consume most of that starchy carbohydrate around workouts mm -hmm. right around physical physical activity now there is you know a lot of talk about the ketogenic diet which is an ultra low carbohydrate diet that forces us into the production of ketone bodies as part of fat oxidation ketogenic diet has its utility and people clearly lose weight on it. They become more insulin sensitive on it. And a lot of people don't know this. It also has a pretty significant anti-convulsant effect. In fact, that's where its initial medical use began was as an anti-convulsant nutritional strategy to prevent people who had intractable seizures from having seizures. But as a nutritional strategy for high powered strength training, I think it's a loser. And, you know, people say, well, you know, you'll become fat adapted and you'll move your crossover point to the right. And that's true. But no matter how far over you, your crossover point is the point in which you start preferentially, you know, you, you increase your power output to the point where you have to preferentially burn carbohydrate instead of fat. And if you push that to the right, then you're able to do more and more high power work with fat oxidation than before. But no matter how far you push that crossover point to the right, you'll never get the same power output from fat oxidation that you will from carbohydrate metabolism. That will never, ever happen. It's just biochemistry. So I actually don't allow my athletes to do the ketogenic diet and do heavy training. I have allowed athletes to you know, say, well, I really wanna do the ketogenic diet. I really wanna lose this weight and they're really committed to it, I'll let them do it, but I won't let them do it under full loading. Like I just won't put the full load on their bar. And what you see when people do that is they tap out pretty quick, right? So pretty quick. A little quick, difficult. Pretty quickly they'll go back to carbohydrates before they train. So I'm sorry, I had to get that off my chest. And you know, I, um, I talked to Robert Santana sort of our, you know, the nutritional guru in our strength community about this. I'm like, am I wrong? Have you, have you changed your mind about this? Am I wrong about it? But he's like, no, it's crazy. You know, high powered strength training means carbohydrates. So, you know, just get used to it. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to, you know, eat donuts all the time, but sure. You know, we're still going to be moderate about it. So that's, that's, part of the nutrition. You have anything to add the nutrition aside from, you know, you got to get your protein, you need a little bit of fat enough for, you know, for hormone health and fat soluble vitamins. And I don't really want to go down the rabbit hole of supplements, but I guess I'll just briefly say, sure. I take creatine and I think that's all that's really necessary. And creatine is meat. It's a meat component. Sure. Right. That's all it is. And you just give yourself a little bit of an edge with a little bit more. And, right. you know, and we know that it's safe. It probably helps a little bit on the margins for most people. I feel like it does. It's not transformative, but you know, it helps you get that extra one or two reps, you know, in a volume workout. It extends your capacity in the anaerobic energy system just a little bit. And so I take it too. You you take creatine? I do yeah. not. Yeah. I did once, but maybe didn't feel the... like it made a difference. No. Yeah. It doesn't for everybody. Maybe it did and I didn't know it. <laughs> um so and yeah, I'm the same way, Noah. I'm not a big fan of supplements. You know, people take all kinds of, you know, L-carnitine and- Well, uh, hold on a minute though, because you are a big fan of caffeine. Caffeine's not a supplement. I, I know, but I'm saying it's another- It's a macronutrient. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I, knew, I knew we were going somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's the elixir of life. No, right. it's true. I do use, ca I, I use caffeine throughout the day and I would not dream of coming into the gym to work out without a full tumbler of fresh, <laughs> hot, delicious coffee. Uh, that would never happen. And I do take a like one of these like pre-workout supplements that's got a little bit of, of creatine, a little bit of beta alanine in it. How much does it help? I don't know. Um, but mostly I just take that sort of like as a kind of a tasty hydration before I get under the bar. I take my creatine at night. 
I don't get bloated per se, but it just upsets my stomach a little bit. So part of what I eat before I work out, part of the reason why it's just two bagels and a little bit of liquid is that otherwise I feel just like I'm kind of sloshing around and my performance suffers. That's a, that's a commonly reported yeah. you know, sort of side effect of that. But the beauty of that is that any benefit that creatine is giving you is having elevated levels in your body over the long term. That's right. And so it's important to understand that like if you take creatine, like let's say that you're working out, you decide you're going to try creatine and you take creatine right before a workout, that's not going to help you. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. It's not going to do anything for you. It's basically loading your muscles with creatine over time. So I actually have a very simple approach to creatine. I just take a little of it every day right. and supplement, and I eat plenty of meat. So I know I have plenty of creatine in my total intake and it builds up in my muscles over time, reaches a steady state. And because I train my muscles all the time, a lot of that muscle creatine is going to be in the form of phosphocreatine, which mm -hmm. is what I need it to be. And so it's there for me when I need it. But if the idea that creatine is a pre-workout supplement is completely wrongheaded. It's not that at all. It's something that you that you take every day. So I think that message is clear. The, you know, what you really need to be doing is attending to your sleep and nutrition. Supplements for the most part, you know, even something like creatine, it helps on the margins a little bit. Other supplements, there's just not good data for them. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing that you but always have- But there's good marketing for them. But there's good marketing for them. And the other thing that you have to have in the back of your mind at all times is here in North America, in the United States, we don't regulate these supplements like they do in other parts of the world uh, because freedom. And you know, you're not really sure what you're getting a lot of the time. So caveat emptor, buyer beware, and you know most of these things are not going to help you do far better just making sure that you get your sleep your nutrition and uh, and other stuff like that so that covers a pretty broad range of recovery factors what else do we have anything else on our list here and it may not be on your list but i think with females we have a lot more trouble getting adequate protein in our diet. Right, and we promised you we would talk about that a little bit. So, uh, and not just females, a lot of people report they have enough trouble getting you know, their target amount of protein. So tell us a little bit about the challenges that you face there. I, in order to get enough protein, I have to have whey shakes. Yeah. I do as well. So it's not just a, a master's no. problem. No. It's difficult to get enough protein. It, yeah. it, can, it can be. And I hate to call it a supplement because a whey shake is, is a meal. It's, yeah. it's food, right? Yeah. It's basically a, a milk product. And we shouldn't call it a whey shake. We should call it a protein shake because whey is not the only protein supplement. Nowadays, there's a lot of options. Yeah, you can get casein and albumin and those kinds of things as well. I take about four ounces of yogurt, plain yogurt, put it in a, a shaker, I put a scoop and a half away on top of that, put in some fresh frozen berries. Well, they aren't fresh if they're frozen, I guess. But frozen berries to give it a, a, some thickness. Fill it up to the line with milk and put it on my Ninja mixer. And Your Ninja it's mixer? 50, yeah. 51 grams of protein. Which is a pretty good slug of protein. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that probably gets you a long way. I always have it when I get home from a workout and uh, one time during the day. I'll That's my strategy as well. And some people have called that into question. This, you know, the idea that I got in my early days of lifting was like, you have carbohydrates before and you have protein after. You fuel the workout and then you provide your body with the building blocks it needs to adapt to the workout. That's been called into question by recent research. I don't care, I do it anyway. It seems to work for me and for my clients. You should probably be eating protein regularly through the day. Sure, and absolutely. And after you finish working out, is a great time to have it's a meal a great time that has to have protein. A meal and so have protein. Yeah. you really can't go wrong. Yeah, right. I have to get the protein in some place. The right. other thing that we that we that comes up, and every now and then somebody will come on like, "Well, yeah, it's been shown that like one gram per pound of body weight for protein is too much, and you're you know you're not going to use all of that." Well, first of all, I've seen that literature. I'm not sure that I buy into it. I have some methodological problems with it. They didn't look at what happened to, pro to muscle protein accretion over the long term. And then the other thing is there's also the practical considerations. So 
any protein target can be a little bit difficult to hit. I find that if I tell people to aim for one gram per pound of body weight per day, sometimes they'll hit it, often they won't. And so I like for my athletes to aim high when it comes to their to their protein macronutrient target. Right. And then I find that you know they're gonna do better. Also, masters have an anabolic resistance. They have a harder time turning on protein synthesis. And one of the best ways to do that is with more protein. Mm -hmm. So I don't make any apologies for having my masters aim high when it comes to protein. So I'm sticking with the one gram per pound of body weight per day in my practice. Um, so recovery, it's essential. Learn it, love it, live it. Mm -hmm. What else have we got? I think that's, I think we pretty much hit the high points there. Yep. And anything to add? No, I think we covered it. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode and the previous one. On I enjoyed this series. it. Yeah. And that all being said, this is Jonathan Sullivan with Barbell Logic coming to you from Grace Joe Strength and Conditioning with our Barbell Prescription series of Barbell Logic podcasts. Noah, thanks once again. My pleasure. We'll talk to you all next time. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.